Guests of the Institute, please take your seats. Guests of the Institute, please take your seats. The program is due to begin soon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Aspen Institute. My name is Libby Franklin, and I'm the Managing Director of Public Programs here at the Institute. And we're so delighted to welcome you all here today. Um, before we get started, we have a few people that we'd like to thank. Always first, a, a warm thank you to Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn for their generosity in supporting the series over the years, which has allowed so many great conversations to take place here. Um, and thanks, too, to Politics and Prose for being here with us. They're situated right over there by the elevators, and they're selling Professor Schiller's new book. It's not too early to do some Christmas shopping for your loved ones, so check it out over there. Also, um, Professor Schiller will be signing books in the back of the room directly following the conversation. So I invite you to um, come say hello. Um, and a final thank you to our esteemed speakers today. Let me move over to the side here. Um, <laughs> professor Robert Schiller is Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. His new book is Narrative Economics. That's what we're here to talk about today. It was out last month from Princeton Press, but he's authored many others, 12 in fact, I think, is that right? 12, mm -hmm. 12 others, um, including the New York Times bestseller, Irrational Exuberance. He also writes for the Economic View column for the New York Times, where you can read him on a variety of topics. And as you all know, he's a pioneer of the field of behavioral finance and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2013. Thank you, Professor Schiller, for being with us and for making the trip from New Haven today. Though I told him on his way up he can, he can take his New England weather right back <laughs> up on to New Haven with him. We don't, we're, we don't cope very well down here. Um, and joining him, we have our very own Ida Rodmacher. Ida is vice president of the Institute, where she also serves as executive director of the Financial Security Program. There, she heads a number of exciting cross-disciplinary initiatives um, to address financial challenges facing U.S. households. And Ida also now co-chairs the first enterprise-wide initiative here at the Institute, the Partnership for an Inclusive Economy. So thank you, Ida, as always, for your collaboration and friendship. Um, and with that, I'll let you two take it away. Thank you. Help me welcoming them. Thanks, Libby. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for braving the weather, and apparently even worse than that, the parking lot. For many of you, I heard it was uh, quite, a, quite an experience to get here. So, so thanks for joining us today. And thank you, Professor I Schiller. Do, I do. Oh, OK, there's my mic. There you are. There you are. So this is great. We've, uh, the last time that you and I met, uh, three of the people at the meeting brought their entire stack of books of yours. And you spent half the meeting autographing books okay. and only half the time giving a lecture. So now we're going to put the autographs at the end of the meeting so we can right. have more time. Um, 
for this. And I want to I want to get into this book. For those of you who haven't read it yet, uh, narrative economics is feels to me like an evolution of a point of view that you have held uh, throughout the work, which distinguishes you, uh, which is that there is an, a, there's a broader toolbox than many economists use to explain the ups and downs and um, growth and stagnation of markets. Uh, so in Irrational Exuberance, you certainly have worked there. Your Nobel Prize was about that. Now you're talking about narrative as a driver of markets. So how, what got you interested in this tool, and what made you decide to write this book? I think my interest dates back to my teenage years. Uh, when I was 19 years old at the University of Michigan, I, I was an econ major, but I took a history course. And the history course assigned a book by Frederick Lewis Allen, written in 1931, about the Roaring Twenties. But it also talked a little bit about the beginnings of the Great Depression. And uh, the, the description of human nature that I got from Allen's book, which was a bestseller in the 30s, uh, was so different from what I heard in the econ department. Uh, his history of the 1920s, he was really interested in fads, uh, uh, crazy ideas that swept the country. Uh, he didn't ever say going viral. But that's, I thought, what it was. And, people, and, and then there was a sudden change in public opinion after 1929. And people thought the 1929 crash was, apoc was a, uh, uh, apocalyptic. Somehow that narrative got started, that there was a big change, and that the 20s were fake, and they were built on lies and deception. Uh, how could that not be important, I thought? for economics. Mm. Can we just talk about the Great Depression in terms of Federal Reserve policy and a few celebrity speeches? <laughs> it's about what all those people were thinking, and, and it seemed to me demonstrably changing. But economics is a science, and th th their sense of scientific respectability meant that you just ignored all the crazy things that people are saying. But it seems like you shouldn't. It's been on my mind ever since. Well, and, it, and it's been, in some ways, Im implied more in some of your writing, you know, even yeah. before this, right? So your claim to fame as an economist is your ability to forecast you know, bubbles. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that that. But, so this was obviously part of that. I mean, you've talked about the contagion of ideas, even in books before this. But you know, when I think about going ahead and naming narrative, story. You know, that's, in some ways, part of the reason that's so interesting is because of, it's you saying it, you know? So like in the beginning of the book, I'll just say a, a quote here. Uh, Most contemporary economists tend to think that public narratives are not, quote, not our field. If you press them, they might suggest you check with other departments of the university, <laughs> like the one I was in, anthropology. Go talk to the anthropologists. Um, uh, or such as journalism or sociology, but scholars in these other fields often find it difficult to tread in the land of economic right. theory, thus leaving a gap in the study of narratives and their effects on economic events. Do you feel like you get all the way there in this book? Oh, no. This is a call to, uh, for more research. I think that we're actually at a turning point in, in history that is, I mean, at, I mean, within the last couple decades or so, caused by digitization and the ability to search, which is something most of us do like every day now, right? You're searching online for something or another. And we're seeing all kinds of texts uh, being digitized. So you have already newspapers, magazines, books, uh, legal briefs, uh, even personal diaries and church sermons. They're getting digitized. And you can search over them. So there's evidence there about what people are thinking. Economists, ever since Milton Friedman, have said we should never ask people why they do things or because they can't tell you. They're doing these calculations in their head. <laughs> they can't verbalize them. Well, I, I think he has a point. They can't verbalize how they make economic decisions easily. But they can tell stories, and they are telling stories. You just have to listen in and infer What's changing through time? It's something that economists have always thought we shouldn't be doing. Ever since Friedman, 
Don't do that. It's called revealed preference. Look at what people actually do. Get quantities of sales, prices, interest rates. Analyze that. Yeah. Uh, th well, we've done that for half a century, and I don't think that we yet have mastery or understanding big economic events. You, you said in a couple of interviews that you see narrative economics as a subset of behavioral economics. But I actually wonder if it's not a broader macro frame for a new yeah. economics. And I wonder, you could say it's, a little bit about it. It's interesting it. the way departments uh, separate. You said you went, you studied anthropology. Yeah. But we also have sociology, and we also have psychology. Yeah. We and used within to talk about it as we would study all those things that all those other departments, poli sci, would do, yeah. and everything. We would study power, and we would just take all the capital letters off because it was always really just about human interaction in space, and you, you know, looking yeah, at that. Yeah. So it was. We were only looking at revealed preferences and what people said about it, and yeah. and that was unsatisfying to me without also coupling it with economics as a second area of focus. But to your point, um, yeah, so behavioral economics really has evolved alongside of what you've been doing in, this, in your world of economics, but you've been kind of adjacent to the behavioral economics. Well, actually, yeah, I worked piece. with Dick Thaler yeah. uh, to develop, uh, we, for 25 years, we organized workshops in behavioral economics. So it, it, it was a, it's growing in, in yeah. acceptability. When we started out, it was considered kind of flaky. Uh, economists thought this is the so-called queen of the social sciences, economics. It's a mathematically grounded in theory, which are elegant. I, I agree that they're elegant, but I think they can be improved. Well, Im improved, to your point, probably for the, there's a moral imperative for them to be improved, right? Because when we go through booms and busts, when we go through the, um, the, the different, when, when economies crash, right, the, the real implications for human lives, and quite frankly, for the environment, if we don't do better at forecasting, right. are, uh, in, there's a lot at stake. So I think that's why you're excited about writing a book like this. Um, what right. are some of the, you go through a whole bunch of different <coughs> kinds of narratives that re, you talk about perennial narratives mm -hmm. and you talk about constellations of narratives. Right. And I wonder if you might pick a couple of the ones that, uh, that you know, I, I think especially right now, especially the AI, uh, the recurrence right. of AI and automation with jobs, but also kind of the relevance of the gold standard and biometallism to Bitcoin. I feel like two yeah. that I think have lots of relevance today. Well, okay. Uh, the, the machines replacing jobs narrative goes clearly back to Aristotle, who in one paragraph in one of his books described uh, exactly what yeah. you just said, that machines are going to, uh, he, he said when a, uh, he, he was referring to the loom, when the loom runs itself, we won't have need for any more employees or slaves. I think they used to have slaves on the looms. Uh, that was an ancient description of it. Uh, but it really started to develop over the last 200 years, fear of machines. And it, it, it comes up suddenly at various points in history as a turning point. Right now is the turning point. Notably uh, in 1929. We don't associate that with the Great Depression so much anymore, but it was in fact widely perceived that, the, that this was it. The machines have replaced jobs uh, and robots. They actually said this in 19, around 1930. Even before, it was starting to appear in the book Men and Machines by Stuart Chase, written in 1929, before the crash. He said, the time has come. We are living now in the power age. The horsepower of the machines vastly exceeds human power, and we don't need people anymore, and it's a fundamental problem. Uh, so, uh, but it turns out they were wrong about, it. it wasn't that machines had replaced jobs because the jobs all came back in the 19, 1950s. The other one that you say is Bitcoin. Uh, I, I mentioned, I, I opened the book with that mm -hmm. because I think it's something that uh, we've all heard of, we've all experienced because it's, well, first of all, can I ask for a show of hands? If you'll be, please do is there anyone here who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? I know it's embarrassing to raise your hand. 
I don't see a, a single hand, though. So uh, epidemiologists talk of diseases having penetration rates. You know, uh, the disease comes in an epidemic and goes. And what percent of the population ultimately got the disease? Usually they disappear before everyone got it. This is virtually a 100% penetration uh, epidemic, or it went viral maximally. And you haven't forgotten it yet, either. It's been years, it's been a decade since Bitcoin was out. So why is that so popular? Uh, I can ask you questions. I, I was very pleased to see this year the Nobel uh, Prize went to the inventor of the lithium ion battery, which powers those cell phones in your pocket. That is yeah. a deserving prize. But I, I bet you don't even now remember the name. <laughs> can, can anyone tell me who invented the lithium ion battery? It just didn't go, it's just a battery, it's not cool. <laughs> so, things go viral that are cool, uh, that you can impress people with. So uh, the, the uh, Bitcoin story is a story about Satoshi Nakamoto, who invented it and posted it on the web in 2008, the, the idea of Bitcoin. And he had his email address, and people started answering him, this is a neat idea. Uh, and uh, he gave them, go ahead, to go ahead and do it. And then he disappeared. In fact, nobody remembers meeting him. The, 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 the Bitcoin people said, well, we were getting, we were email correspondence with him, but we never asked to meet him, <laughs> and he's gone. Did he ever exist? So this is a lovely mystery story. And on top, it's cool, it uses Encryption, well, that's like spy versus spy stuff, you know? Encryption technology and advanced computers, cool. It, it appeals to young people who feel that they may be f not demanded in this new world. Uh, it, it, you can easily buy Bitcoin, just go on the web and search buy Bitcoin, and within minutes you will be a participant in the Bitcoin revolution. <laughs> you own Bitcoin. So if people do it to feel one with, uh, with the new world that we live in. Uh, on top of that, it, I'm going, I'll stop. Just to, I, I love to tell stories, too. It's the right <laughs> on place on to top it. of that, it feeds anarchism. There has been this movement ever since the philosopher of Proudhon in the early 19th century that we don't need government at all. If we get rid of government, people will just cooperate. It's natural in human nature. What a dumb idea, but it, it appeals to some people, especially at tax time. And, and it, it, it's, all, it's all these things together made the Bitcoin narrative really go. And uh, it, uh, it, it's very strong. That doesn't mean it won't go away. Epidemics right. eventually disappear. Well, we talked a little bit even offline about how some of these stories have evolved even since you were writing the book. Um, and this feels like one of them, right? So Bitcoin was the first anchor of a conversation about an alternate currency. Then you end up with Libra, with Facebook, right, right. But, and now you've ended up with, I think, Switzerland. Somebody the first, the first federal bank issued uh, digital fiat Although currency. Although it's not is, a blockchain, right? But it's yeah. so it's a but it's but it's moving to a digital. The idea that Bitcoin started to get people's mind around a narrative of. Um, a stored value being in something besides paper, and the paper being something that you talked about, being where stored value used to only be on a gold standard. You know, this right. is an evolution of a narrative that um, what goes, you know, the narrative goes, the technology is also driving the narrative, but it's also driving potential real changes in the economy, right? So do these chipping points of change happen when the narrative and the capacity for something new to happen in the economy come together? Yeah, well, the point is that narrative economics has to incorporate conventional economics. Right. So uh, the Keynesian version of economic, which has some important insight, I, I claim him as one of us, narrative economists. But yeah. he's spawned a, a more technical version. Uh, Keynes wrote a, a, a kind of literary book in 1936 called The General Theory. Uh, but economists couldn't stand his uh, Bloomsbury group of uh, affinities, so they rewrote it in, in a different uh, uh, in a different form in terms of ISLM model and the mathematical equations. Uh, but so I think that we need narrative economics to be part of economics. Yeah. 
And I, I think that, to me, it, uh, I like to see a, a mixture of the economics department and the epidemiology department in the medical school. Oh, and actually, the medical school is becoming very intrusive. And in e it's not only epidemiology, but it, uh, it's also neuroscience. I think neuroscience is changing our understanding of human nature. It's kind of scary what's happening. It's computers are taking over, and then we're also understanding our mind and the, uh, how it's built and how our reactions are not whims of free spirit. They're actually programmed in. And the, the computer program in your brain has bugs in it. There's a book called Brain Bugs, which I recommend, written by a neuroscientist, about all the program errors in your brain. What, and heuristics, as they call it. What proportion of your time do you think you spend reading medical versus <laughs> economic books to actually I, I, something like this? In the book, I, I have a chapter on the consilience, yeah. which is the unity of knowledge. I believe that there are many more approaches. We, we tend to adopt a certain toolkit for understanding things. Yeah. And that explains why we have different, why the anthropology department isn't joined with the sociology department. They seem awfully similar subject matters. Uh, oh, my own department at Yale was called the Department of Economics and Sociology until the 1930s. Ever since, we don't even speak to those sociologists. Anymore. We don't even know where they are on campus. Yeah. So it's unfortunate. I think that trying to understand things like economic events uh, makes it hard. Uh, uh, it's hard to do it with just only one toolkit. Well, and I, and I, so your book came out at a really interesting time in a constellation of other books. So, you know, when I'm thinking about um, Binyamin Applebaum's The Economist Hour that came out around mm -hmm. the same time. Um, and so, you know, that is a story, obviously, in that, you know, it's funny, he'll start out with um, the, lament the lamentation of an economist in the, you know, basements of the Federal Reserve complaining to his wife that night that, uh, you know, he doesn't think that he'll work will ever amount to anything in the Federal Reserve System in the early 1970s yeah. because they're not a part of decision making, right? The economists are in the basement. They're not a part of the key decision making of the of the driving oh, pieces. Yeah. And it turns out that it's you know Paul Volcker, you know, like early on in his career. And the Economist Hour. Does everyone here of, know that narrative? Uh, <laughs> the Economist Hour comes along and kind of says that the 1970s, right? That that moment of really high inflation, like that all of a sudden, the tools that economists had developed because they walled themselves off, because they got very specific, you know, in much the way I think epidemiology right. would have had to develop, right? Following the scientific method, or you know, following the, the kind of like precision, they were able to start helping to solve problems and have answers that nobody else had at a critical time in our history. And his sense is that the economist hour might have now, you know, it might be running 25 minutes too late. You know, like maybe we've gotten made too much of it. It needs to be put back in context. And you're, you're too are calling for, for a very different reason, the unity of knowledge, uh, yeah. embracing these other tools into a toolbox. So, uh, you know, how is this being accepted by people in your own discipline? And how is it being accepted mm. by others that you've been talking to? Well, I gave my... I was president of the American Economic Association. That's where this came from, right? You did I gave my presidential address with some trepidation because <laughs> I thought I might get booed, <laughs> but nobody, no, not one person booed, and uh, I got an applause at the end. I think that the, basically they're open-minded. They tend to be kind of, uh, most people are, are kind of career-oriented. Young people are looking for where people got jobs last year. Young PhDs are very concerned about getting a job, hopefully at a prestigious university, uh, which, by the way, we unfortunately tend to rank too much. You want to be in a highly ranked one instead of a congenial intellectual climate, <laughs> so, or a, a period, a place where in, interesting ideas are coming up. Yeah. Uh, that's not the way we think in the current narrative. Uh, so uh, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard for people to, d to be as open-minded as they naturally are. Uh, I think most people who go into PhD programs are doing it not for the money. They're doing it because they, they, they like the interesting ideas and they want the truth. But then they have this dark realization that they might not get a job if it doesn't look like 
conventional economic. And I know exactly, there's some truth to that. At departmental meetings, I remember people saying, that thinking of hiring someone as an assistant professor, and they, someone said, well, it's interesting stuff, but it's not central to economics today. <laughs> we, need to, we need to have our, uh, so economics departments are more, everyone doing their own thing, but it's all clustered around popular, uh, not all of it, a lot of it is clustered around popular ideas yeah. I, in economics. Yeah. And uh, it's a sign of being too interdirected. Well, maybe we can help to start figuring out where some of these, at least give you a map to where the sociology department is. And <laughs> yes. that could be a good starting point, you know, put it into the orientation work for, for, for young economists. I, I do think that this rising generations conversation, though, is important in a couple of ways. One, it's just interesting that you're using the word narrative in the sense that right now there's a coming of age in America of whose story matters and who is invited to tell stories at the individual level whose story shapes our understanding of things, and that you're actually, you're adding a whole dimension onto that because you're saying that the collective stories we tell then drive market behavior. Right. Uh, and so this question about who are we listening to right. is, seems central to economists right now, but it seems central to society right now. I would bring in, in addition, uh, the comparative literature department. I, I just had lunch from, with a professor there because I thought it's really in, these are people that we don't respect in the econ department. Mm. But uh, uh, novel, it's very hard to predict which novelist will be a hit. Uh, and the same novelist who succeeded once, the next try flops totally. So th there's some uh, human spirit that uh, that is not modeled in, in 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 terms of objective observables. You have to read the story. So I, uh, I had lunch with Peter Brooks at Yale, who uh, wrote a book uh, in comparative literature uh, called Reading for the Story. <laughs> and he, he thinks that the storyline is something essential to the success of a book. And uh, he's trying to get at what is it? You know, some storylines go back to ancient time, and we still remember them. Yeah. Uh, I talked about in my, in my book, uh, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree. Uh, I thought, now that sounds to me like the most insipid story. It's just, he cut it down. He was a boy. He, his father said, did you do that? And uh, what did Washington say? I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> yeah. That narrative went viral in 1802 when... Uh, 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 Parson Weems wrote a book of George Washington. It was a bestseller. We had bestsellers in 1802. They didn't have the internet, but they talked, and it really went viral. Mm -hmm. And I, can anyone tell me what's good about the story of George Washington admitting that he cut down the cherry tree? It's just something that everybody tells. Everybody There's an occasion does. for telling it, something like that. Uh, we want to tie things together, and so it ties together our teaching honesty to our children and... Uh, it's true. I would love, well, I'm, okay, this, so, uh, so our first president and the story through time for him is his honesty and cutting down a cherry tree and cannot tell a lie. I, maybe you could fast forward us to our current sitting political situation and just say a little bit about the current narrative, maybe juxtapose yeah, by that. By the way, George. How subtle was that, people? Was that okay? Yeah. George, Wash George and Martha Washington owned slaves. Uh, she had a lot of slaves, but somehow they were in her name. So let's leave her out of this. George Washington had slaves. He, he released the household slaves at, uh, in his will. So he, but he, I don't think he released all of them, and certainly not her slaves. So how can we forget that? Right. It's suddenly changing the George Washington narrative. It's coming back up again. Yeah. But for, somehow for 200 years, we just forgot that. Uh, maybe he treated them well. I don't know, but uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, obviously it does, but that's not the, the point. Yeah. I think the um, the question of because you, you say that the, the alchemy of a good story and how it can influence a broad set of action has as much to do with um, how who who is telling the story, right. how memorable that person is. Uh, you do go a little bit into discussions of Trump and make America great again, and who 
resonates with um, uh, why, why the narrative he was telling resonates in America today. And you, you actually brought that a little bit back to the kind of folks when you talked about bimetallism, you know, like who, right. who was resonating with a different kind of standard, like an inside of Washington, outside of Washington piece. But maybe a little bit about just current events, and we can have, we'll go to questions here in a few minutes. And so we'd love just broad questions from you all. But um, your own sense of why that, nar did that narrative yeah. resonate at, a, at this particular moment in time in a way that is going to have economic consequences? Okay, I can't speak authoritatively about the bottom line about narrative. I can just give impressions, uh, which are, I, I'm trying to make legitimate. It's legitimate that we give yes. impressions. So uh, I think of Donald Trump as someone who thinks like me in many ways. He thinks about narratives, and he notices narratives that are arising. Uh, so my guess is that the computers replacing jobs has gotten much worse lately, the fear of that, uh, even though it's not always expressed as a fear. Uh, it's artificial intelligence now. It's, re it, it, it's replaced translators for mundane jobs. You can just do a machine translate. It's going to replace all kinds of expert knowledge. I used to be proud. I used to know all the stars. I was an astronomy nut buff. I used to point out the stars and say what they were. I, I tried to impress people with that as a teenager. It doesn't work. They just, you can get a program. You just hold it up, and it'll tell you what your, your phone up. So I think people are, are there's this angst about who am I and, uh, and what, what, why am I important. So it, it takes a skilled writer or a spinner of, I think uh, Trump noticed this narrative, and he's thinking all the time about how to adapt the narratives to his own uh, ambitions. Mm -hmm. And the idea that... Uh, uh, people get some kind of uh, pleasure from what's called basking in reflected glory. Birg, it's called. Uh, and this country is a very successful country. And it looks like computer science was, uh, was mostly invented here. So uh, you want to somehow think that you're part of that. And you want it to be patriotic. You want to think that even if I'll never be a computer genius, my children will, or some, you know, somehow will be vindicated. I'll be, I'm part of America. And Trump tapped into that, uh, that fear, which is not openly expressed, I think. Uh, it's not exactly an active fear at the moment because we have very low unemployment. So people think it's something for the future. But they want to be part of something. They want to buy Bitcoin because it makes them part of the Bitcoin intelligentsia, even though they couldn't explain blockchain. Mm -hmm. or the elliptical curve uh, uh, system that is, underlies its encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what I'm trying to pull out a little bit is, uh, is there more susceptibility to a story when the underlying economic reality for somebody is more or less precarious? So, yeah. you know, when I think about... Um, you know, something else you were writing a lot about a little while ago was some of the, the, the concerns of inequality or the concerns of growing wealth inequality or desperation there. And just, you know, who is primed to hear a story? Um, because the other story that he's really tapped into is the immigration story, right? But he's actually, right. that's the other side of kind of, that's, that is pulling on the fear, not the that is the pessimism that you talk about in your book, not the confidence you talk about in your book. And it feels like he's put those two together in a yeah. way that has really... So he's an exception. He's not an idiot, as some people say. He's very focused. He may be an idiot when it comes to certain aspects of policy that he has the impulse to take into his own hands. Uh, but he does observe uh, trends in narratives. So you can see this coming in, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. What does, for you, the next step look like for the ideas you have in your book? You lay out a pretty specific agenda for what would come next. Right. To take your hunch that narratives are a really important additional tool for an economist's toolbox, right. um, and that there's a way you can take advantage of data and technology to become even, to become, to take that assumption and assertion further and see if there's real grounded, causal ammunition here. Yeah. 
Uh, one thing I'd like to see is, uh, I don't have much interaction with them, but they're here, the marketing department in the business school. That is, I think, the lowest prestige department in the whole university because they have sold their souls to get you to smoke cigarettes or other things. That's the impression we have. If you read marketing journals, they seem to, they are on to narratives. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, but they seem to, the, the, the attitude is, we're training young people to run advertisements for private corporation. I don't see, I haven't read all of it, there must be some, but I don't see them thinking about big questions of democracy or uh, capitalism from the standpoint of narratives. Uh, so I, I, I would like to see more unity among the department. Yeah. Oh, here's a funny thing. Has anyone here heard of a book or an article written jointly by a professor of economics and a columnist at a newspaper or a reporter at a newspaper? I have never heard of that. Why is there this separation? You'd think that they would be fertile partners in a, uh, in a uh, research. I have to ask somebody like David Leonhardt about that. I'm sure he's uh, uh, yeah. been, in the, been in the mix with those things. We're going to go to questions in, a, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, was that what you were about to tell me to do? OK, great. We'll, we'll do that in just a second. You just mentioned um, capitalism. And I actually wonder if that's an emerging narrative. The, I don't know if you you know, just, just what, is, uh, what is its Right now, there's a lot of questioning. We, you know, we've talking a lot about inclusive growth. It, it, now we're talking a lot about inclusive capitalism. You hear everybody from Jamie Dimon on 60 Minutes last night, you know, uh, talking about the, the, the needs it, and the business roundtable making a statement of, on purpose uh, of the corporation. You know, in some ways, again, I guess I'll go back to that full arc from Milton Friedman, and kind of what is the role and the way of of, of markets versus government all the way through to now. Is that for you, like the kind of the capitalism, what we say about markets, what we say about the role of markets in the world and well, how there that is changes? A, there is a new recognition that seems to be coming over people right now that uh, capitalism doesn't always yield a good income distribution. Actually, this recognition has been, had had a wave of success before. In uh, the third edition, to David Ricardo's book, Principles of Political Economy. The third edition came out in the 1830s. Uh, he said, you, I'm paraphrasing him, he added a chapter on mechanization. And he said, before the Luddites years ago, I just blindly assumed that free markets would lead to a, a benefit for everyone. But now I realize that I was wrong. He said that in the 1830s that uh, there's nothing in pure capitalism to say that there won't be an impoverished class. Uh, and I, I think this is something that's, that is happening right now, uh, and we see it in the presidential campaign. Uh, we have a lot of billionaires. Uh, is, this, uh, is this right? Uh, and maybe the nature of the economy is changing so that people can consolidate economic power. Uh, some people can. Well, maybe we could work together to listen to those narratives, see how they come uh, forward. Uh, that's right. We I think it's an important that. topic. And oh, the, the universal basic income yeah. has been discussed many times. I discovered a book uh, about it uh, written in 1795 by Thomas Paine. I recommend it. Uh, it's called Agrarian Justice. He wasn't worried about machines, exactly worried about machines replacing jobs. He was worried about a landowning land class, monopoly, and all the other, we're all itinerant farm labor, that that's where the country was heading. And he advocated, he didn't call it a universal basic income. So, uh, and then it came up again in 1879 with Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty. So it's a, the title of his book reveals it. We're seeing tremendous economic progress. The railroads, locomotives, power, steel, yeah, all sorts of things happening in 1873. And he said, but at the same time, we see poverty in our midst. That was an explosive book. But th these things all come and go. They fade away because it doesn't seem to be happening right now. So we're in another one of these episodes now. Yeah. And uh, is artificial intelligence more dangerous 
Uh, maybe it is. I, I don't actually know. Maybe it's, we're now at the turning point. Uh, at least it feels like we are, and people are talking. Like, inequality is going to get worse unless we do something that departs from capitalism, pure, unadulterated capitalism. Well, what I, what I love is that uh, in narrative economics, you've, you've modeled in this book that just like there are economic cycles, there are narrative cycles. And you've really called out a few that are worth paying attention to, that are worth reading about. Um, and uh, I hope that, that a lot of uh, next generation economists uh, take your call to action and start to uh, break down some, some barriers and, and talk to other social science disciplines and, and wider um, about this work. Uh, we're going to go to questions now. And uh, we'll come back to me if we don't have some more. But there's one right in the front row here. Thanks. Here's you. you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, hi. I'm Paul Bergeron. I work for the National Apartment Association. Uh, I was wondering if you think that some of the social media platforms that are putting in rules and policies about speech that's being delivered through their channels, do you think that that's helping the narrative or hurting the narrative and how? Well, we've long had I'll answer, Get, yeah. uh, we've long had laws about libel, which seem to interfere with free speech. You can't. Th this goes back, I suppose, hundreds of years. You can't make up stories about someone and pretend they're true to ruin their reputation. Uh, so I, I think we've lived with law. I think we do have to have laws against libel uh, because it can be very destructive. Uh, where we then it gets kind of fuzzy where we draw the line, and we're facing that again now, especially with the social media or, or, and uh, ability to rapidly turn uh, your opinions into a, a viral um, event. Uh, and I think it's a difficult one for the law school to figure out how to uh, how to deal with this problem, and it requires it requires trust. We have to have a country where. You could abuse libel laws and punish people for, you know, political reasons, uh, and uh, it requires an atmosphere of trust. That was my column yesterday in the, or day before yesterday in the New York Times, that I think we're losing our sense of trust, yeah. uh, which is uh, deadly to uh, d democracy. Thank you. So uh, go ahead and go there. And then I've seen there's in the middle, and then there's two over here beside each other. So, so we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead with you, and then we'll go over here. We've got plenty of time, so we can. Have Great. Thank you for this. Um, my name is Negar Abai. I work with the Public Affairs Office of the Baha'i Community in the United States. And I had an interest. Um, you were talking about behavioral economics and the relationship with this. And I was thinking of Samuel Boyle's work on um, the relationship of moral narratives and discourse to incentives at sort of the micro level. And I was wondering whether moral narratives get a particular, um, get particular attention in your book. I haven't read it yet. And if that means then, in addition to the discomfort with narratives, whether economists will also need to think a little more about normative claims and assumptions. Right. Um, and so that sort of mix of things. I actually don't know. Samuel Boyles? I'll have to uh, he, read it. he wrote a book called Moral Economy, and he makes an argument about okay. the moral narratives and discourse that accompany uh, policy interventions and how that crowds yeah. in or out incent different incentives. Oh, okay. Is he still at the Santa Fe Institute? Is that where he is? I believe so, yeah. yeah. See, one, one problem with uh, advocating consilience uh, is that the literature is beyond anyone's ability. <laughs> so, I've, I've failed to read some very essential items in the anthropology <laughs> literature. Well, you're reading. I mean, this is an economic history that um, you're incredibly versed in this. So I'm happy to give you a few more from the economic anthropology office. Let me, let me just say about morals. Here, yeah. I do mention in the book that narratives have mor morals, the, the, the moral of the story, and that that's part of what makes can make them contagious. Uh, and and that uh, one thing about uh, Anger is not an emotion that's recognized in the economics department. There are a lot of boycotts, and a lot of people are boycotting products. Even now, I think it's a, for companies that don't employ women or, or, what, or they mistreat workers, people are boycotting quietly. Uh, and so th this is an important force which we need to incorporate into economics. Yeah. Come on down. There's uh, two gentlemen right here, and then one across in the middle there. So you can hand it across when you're done. I have a question. Uh, I'm Mark Brodsky, retired scientist and CEO. Uh, 
What's common now on the internet are multiple narratives aimed at different audiences. You look at the election campaign in 2016, there wasn't one narrative, there were narratives picked for different audiences that were completely different. Right. There seems something immoral about that, but on the other hand, it's very effective. Do you have any comment on narrative economics and whether economists should intentionally create different messages for different audiences? Uh, that's what we rely on the news media to expose. <laughs> they try to do that, yeah. Uh, so this is also a, a factor of new technology, as you say. Now, uh, uh, the computer doesn't even ask your permission, or the, the browser. It, it'll bring up stories like the ones that you've searched before. And you get the faulty impression that there's, most people think like I do. And then when you talk to your spouse, you find immediately <laughs> it ain't so. <laughs> she's right here living with me, and she's got a completely different view. She's reading. She has her own laptop. <laughs> uh, she's, yeah, I'm sure she's, her, her algorithms are a little different. So this is of concern. And maybe there are subtle changes that could be required of the internet, like to remind you all the time that this message was brought to you because we know your prejudices. Uh, something like, I don't know what, we have to invent a way of, of preventing this problem. James Sang, retired. Uh, you mentioned uh, Keynes, and of course Keynes' teacher was a guy named Marshall. And there's a very famous uh, line from Marshall, which is that you do economics by watching out for the math, and then you turn it into English. Oh, yeah. Then you uh, think of some good examples, and then you burn the math. That, that was Marshall? Uh, yeah, Alfred Marshall, yeah. 1905. It's, uh, I, I, as a physicist, I always found it a very interesting quote. But how is, are you going back to the past? Uh, I hope I'm going back to the past in some ways, because these, these were intelligent people who lived at different times. I've been going back to other economic events in history and reading contemporary accounts by news people. Uh, to get a refreshing look at it. You know, maybe they had a better knowledge. They were there, right? They had a better knowledge of what was happening. So you mentioned bimetallism briefly. I go back to reading newspapers of the 1890s during the depression of the 90s, and there's a lot of talk by businessmen that this bimetallism is going to be too disruptive. I can't do business if we're going to change the money supply. Uh, and you know, nobody remembers that. But it, it sounds like Bitcoin to me. <laughs> Uh, the, the whole event in the 1890s, the, the bimetallism, which you have probably forgotten. I won't ask for a show of hands, but it was lively then and anger producing and uh, in, people accusing each other of immorality. Uh, so yeah, I like to go back and I, I, I think that uh, uh, it's also, actually it was in the Wa Washington Post. Uh, Heather Long is mm -hmm. a, a writer for the Washington Post and she called me up and interviewed me and then she wrote a story that uh, has been talked about a lot, about the importance of studying history or literature or such humanities in college, arguing that the idea that to be a success you have to be more vocational now is really wrong. Uh, I think that what we're trying to convey in a college education is a sense of uh, the variety of thinking, the, the uh, reality of things, uh, and not just skills that will get you into your first assignment at business. Yeah, and go ahead. There's um, there's two here in the middle, just right here, and then right there. It's funny. And while you're while, well, actually, go ahead with your question. Thank you, uh, Enac International Urban Alliance professor. I'm so delighted to see you here because I used your famous Yale uh, video lectures in the program I set up in Bucharest, Romania real estate program. Uh, my question is about uh, whether uh, a narrative can change market behavior, which is obviously a neocortex, uh, emotional and reptilian, uh, quite honestly. And in my area, because I'm an urban planner, uh, if they can change uh, driving behavior and convincing people to drive less, which is absolutely critical for climate change. Uh, so you're asking whether narratives can change behavior in general. Uh, I, well, that's a core, corner, a cornerstone assumption of my book. Uh, but I think that uh, we, we have learned that from social sciences outside of economics, that people 
Uh, they like they live a story. You know, who am I? Is a question that people are always asking, and uh, other people may be ignoring you. <laughs> you have to think of some reason why I am important. And most of us succeed in developing a personal story that uh, puts us at the center of the universe in some dimension <laughs> that we can think of. So uh, things like uh, uh, carpooling. I think those, uh, those are informed by narrative. Like uh, Greta Thunberg uh, is a nice narrative. Mm. She went absolutely viral. Uh, and what is it about her? Uh, she speaks very well. She's Swedish, but English is her second language. She can get up in front of big crowds. She shows no fear. And she's kind of eloquent. Uh, it's also her story that, uh, how did she get famous? Uh, her father was helping her, and he placed her outside of important events, and she was like a beggar sitting there with a sign. <laughs> but she was begging for climate improvement. Um, so that was an intentional, uh, her father may deserve a lot of credit because she wouldn't have been able to organize these trips. So yeah, so I think that that's the way we make improvements with uh, new narratives that, uh, that ups may upset people and make them angry, but then instill a different moral value. I think we've, we're largely a success with climate change. A lot of, uh, Donald Trump is 73 years old. Uh, he has a different attitude toward climate. Mm -hmm. Young people today, I, I think, are kind of behind. They just want to get things moving faster. So, Jen Rogers, so looking for other questions. There's one in the back. And then there's one just in the corner, Azalea, when you're done there, right behind the woman in the blue sweater. Thank you. Uh, Ted Truman at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, I'd like to, and I once studied at Yale and taught there. So, uh, and uh, one of my professors, Bill Brainerd, who you know, oh, yeah. he used to say, this is sort of turning your story around, your, your, uh, narrative, your narrative around. He used to say when people would give up and give a technical paper, so what is your story, right? So he was looking for yeah. this narrative that attached, the, uh, uh, that attached to what uh, the scribbles on the blackboard, if you want to put it that way. Is that, is that a reasonable way of thinking about this proposition? It's funny you bring him up. He lives right next door to me, and I talk to him <laughs> all the time. But you and, must, rec uh, you must rec recognize, recognize that phrase, or at least I, that I remember it that way. Uh, I don't know if I know exactly that phrase, but I know how he acts in seminars. It's kind of uh, skeptical but supportive. Uh, and he's good at peering through the math. Uh, and so I think that maybe that's what we need. Uh, we need people who, who are listening to mathematical economics. Uh, they're like nice stories. They're a story in their own for people who are mathematically inclined. But we do have to ask what, what underlies this, and are these assumptions useful or not? The assumptions that the models are built on. Question there, and then we'll go over there. Uh, uh, go ahead. OK, I, I'm Finley Lewis, a CQ roll call. Uh, you, you mentioned bimetallism in the 1890s. Uh, and of course, we're talking about free silver uh, and the William Jennings Bryan speech, cross of gold, shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. Uh, how did, I mean, that's a hell of a narrative, uh, but it didn't, well, it didn't yeah. go anywhere because by uh, within two or three years, the uh, market had come back and nobody, <laughs> we never heard about free metal, about free silver again. Well, we still hear about it. I like to tell that I, I can go on about this story. Uh, they actually, uh, in 1896, Brian, that was a, that line you gave was from his, the last line in his Democratic Convention acceptance speech. And, and he got the nomination on the strength of that speech. Yeah, the important, the interesting thing is, he was quoting somebody else, uh, and he didn't actually acknowledge that. So uh, the other person, it was a congressman, said exactly that in Congress. It just wasn't the right scene. It wasn't the right guy. <laughs> so the narrative didn't go viral. But that, ver that narrative went viral, that we still remember it. Today. What's, what's so special about this line, you shall not crucify us on a cross of gold? I don't know, but it, it, he recognized. He's like Donald Trump. He recognizes. He heard the speech months before, and he he's, he's kept thinking about that line. 
Not only did that, he embellished it. He stood up at the very end. It was the last sentence in his speech. And he stood up like this, like a preacher. And he thundered, you shall not crucify us on a cross of gold. And for, according to newspapers, there was a moment, a minute of silence. And then they broke into tumultuous applause and they came up on stage and they carried him off in a victory. I don't know. People still remember that, even though there were no television cameras there to record it. And then in the 1900 election, uh, he, uh, uh, he brought that up. He was the same pair, uh, ran again. He brought that up again, also unsuccessfully. But in 1900, L. Frank Baum, during the election campaign, wrote the book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, uh, that made fun of McKinley uh, as the called Wizard of Oz. It was about the gold standard. You had Dorothy uh, dancing down the yellow brick road, that's gold, uh, uh, with silver slippers, that's the silver. Which were only made ruby when that was cut, when that TV was, <laughs> right? You, I oh, in this 1939, in your book. Judy Garland. That, when Judy Garland did it, and they had first had color, tele, color films, that's right. so they made them ruby slippers for that, but go on with the gold. And then and Judy Garland was famous for the rest of her life. That, that was the beginning of her career. And the story is still going. You can go right now to New York and see Wicked, which is a new version of the same story. So it all comes out of that, but it's blurred because we're emotional and story-like creatures. We don't remember the moral anymore, the bimetallism moral. We keep telling the stories. That yeah, let's go, go through there. There's a question back here. And I like we'll, that. Thank we'll you for bringing that up. Through. But his point was, again, that the narrative stuck, but it didn't change our economics. It didn't It, it didn't, didn't quite make it. Us and then in the story. 1930s, they were talking about bimetallism again as maybe what we should do now. And then somebody else came up with the idea of electronic money. Does anyone remember this? Electronic money, we would change from the dollar to the watt. <laughs> and the money would be backed up by, by electric current. You could, I don't know how it would work. But <laughs> it never, that one never flew. Uh, and, but Bitcoin probably won't fly either. We'll see, maybe. Keep going. Tim, right in the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Tim Shaw. I'm with the Aspen Institute, but I'm also one of those young, oh, one, one of those young PhD students worried about the long-term utility of my potential <laughs> degree. Um, in the spirit of the research orientation and furthering those questions, I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about how you propose measuring the link between narrative and economic outcomes and disentangling the causality. So why, right. why is it that narrative would cause economic change and not the right. underlying economic change? Well, first of all, I point out that economics can't do controlled experiments as well as other, uh, we can do small scale, but if you're talking about macroeconomics, you can't try to destroy the economy as an experiment and to see if it works. But we do have controlled experiments in other fields, right. like psychology and uh, marketing, and they have established that m narratives matter. In fact, it, if you go to journalism school, the first thing they'll tell you is, don't start a news story with some statistic. Start a news story with a, they call them stories, in fact. Start it with a story about John and Bill Murray, who had the problem, and uh, they went to experts, and. Tell a story for a few paragraphs that exemplifies, and they'll get the readers' attention. They know this is absolutely a fact that, uh, that done through, con concluded by experiments that advertising uh, works better as a narrative skit or something. Just like we also have in marketing, we have experiments that show that playing soft music in the background of an ad enhances its appeal, and so they know that, so they put music into their TV ads. Now, the other question is, how can we be more convincing that it's an important part of economics? We know that it has a potential. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I don't have a completely worked out answer than that. We can look, as economists do, for natural experiments. This is a, a, a very major new technique. Uh, something, it actually dates back to Milton Friedman again, who called them quasi-controlled experiments. Or it even goes back further to hint, uh, Henry Varnum, who gave the 20, 1912 presidential address at the AEA, saying that we are lucky that politicians in, in, implement so many goofy ideas generating experiments that we could never have paid for. 
It just happened. So you read it. This is what Milton, I, I'm not a big Milton Friedman acolyte, but I would say that's what his book, a famous book on uh, a, a monetary history of the United States did. He looked at things that changed the money supply that couldn't have been feedback from the other economy and, and looked what happened after. So I think we can deal with causality, but we haven't done it for narratives. In the, they just it, they don't they just ignore them in the economics departments. Final question, because if not, I can come up with one. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Tony Spadaro. I'm a retired intelligence analyst. I want to ask you about validation and verification. Now, as, as you recall, I think it was FDR who said he had just met with six of his economic advisors and received 10 opinions and <laughs> two from Dr. Keynes. Uh, but the, there are interests in the world, financial and, and trading interests, that, that have, a, have generated narratives. And they, have, they put forward their experts who are combating with other experts. So how do we distinguish between really good narratives that are supported by really lousy economics? <laughs> <laughs> which, which, to his credit, I think you, you do deal well. I, I think a, you, that's the deep question. You keep raising it in the book, and you keep recognizing that narrative may be supported by fact or not. It's still going to potentially drive. There are there are events in history that are hard to reconcile with with uh, conventional economics. Uh, so, for example, in Germany between 1928 and 1933. The Nazi Party went from five percent of the vote, I mean, approximately, to something like forty percent of the vote in just five years' time, and that was during the Great Depression. In the United States, we also had a movement uh, toward radical ideas, but it didn't go to, it didn't have the same outcome. Oh, it had. It is the narratives I think that you turn to there. There and there was someone spinning narratives deliberately. Uh, and uh, it had different contagion in different countries. How else can we explain? Th these ideas that it could be that we don't need to look at narratives, it, it seems like these major events suggest to me it, it just couldn't be that simple, that economics and politics and views of ourselves have to be interconnected, and they, they, they depend on the, the, way, the kind of constellations of narratives already out there. Uh, and the impact of celebrities who choose to back one or another. Uh, I, I, wanna, I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm do, I, I think, think this is a, I think it's the question you're asking yourself, though. You know, yeah. So I think answering it is going to come We want to stay circle. close to objective reality. And big events like the Great Depression or, other, or World War II are a part of a, a, of a constellation of narratives that I don't see how it, we could consider it at all interesting that these narratives don't matter. Right, right. And I want to thank you, Professor Schiller, for, you know, in some ways, countercurrent, uh, raising the question, raising the importance of rethinking uh, how, we, how we learn and how we predict and how we forecast, and just continuing to challenge both the economic discipline and all of us to think about a more holistic way of putting together information in this new era to solve really critical problems and to potentially mitigate some of the, the negative outcomes that can happen, which is, at the end of the day, a lot of what your whole work has been dedicated to. So thank you for that. Thank you all for being here uh, very much. Appreciate it. And there's uh, book signings, I believe, just over to the left. So you'll stick around for a little while for I that? Go over. Yeah, yeah over there. That, yeah. OK, great. Thank you.